Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. It's time to take global stories making headlines in our national dailies. And joining me to review the papers this morning is Professor Camilius Sani Fage. He's from the Department of Political Science by Euro University, Kano. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining me. Good morning, and thank you for having me. All right. So I was going to ask, um, we know that there was, there was a protest from August 1st, which was on Thursday, that rocked the nation everywhere, most places in Nigeria, most people went out to protest, and it was hashtag end bad governance, hashtag hunger protest. Now, I, we saw a lot of footage happening from Kanu, a lot of things that were happening there, and people took out to the streets en masse protesting, and I just want to hear from you, how is Kanu right now? especially with all that happened over the weekend since Thursday? Yeah, yeah. now Kano is a little bit quiet because of the curfew that has been imposed. Um, but it is tense, given what happened in the last uh, two days, two or three days. So people are very much uh, apprehensive. Um, they are very much scared. So since... Uh, are not normal here, but even though it is uh, quiet, because you can hear the serene and the police running around, uh, you know, all day, all night through, and uh, so that is how the situation now is in Kano. Hmm. Well, so with the coffee and everything, I'm sure people are indoors. Are people adhering to the coffee at the moment? Because I saw a footage that some people said they were still going to go out regardless. Um, of what the government is saying? Yeah, you see, there are people who are saying they will go out, but the majority, you know, have been cowed down. They were, have been scared mm. because actually the, the death rate is unimaginable. You know, uh, what the people, what papers are carrying, uh, I think is far, far less than what happened. So people are scared about... Uh, Actually, what happened, especially what happened day before yesterday in Corona, mm. and uh, eyewitnesses, you know, uh, said they saw a lot of uh, corpses, and uh, you know that was what one angered many people, mm -hmm. and two was scared a lot of people not come out, and uh, in fact, if not sporadic uh, you know gunshot in the night hmm. as many people might have come out because uh, you know they are so much paid up but you know but uh, the fact that uh, the police have been shooting in the air uh, all night so that is what i think scared people from coming out that's quite unfortunate because i'm sure these people came out just to um, voice out their grievances just to tell the government how they feel, expecting the government to protect them and, you know, just ensure that the government even hears them in the first place. I'm sure none of them thought they would lose their lives and our heart goes out to them. I, I, I know that a lot happened in Kano and I'm just hoping that, you know, God will give them, the people, the families, he'll give them the fortitude to bear the loss at the moment. But let's delve right into the papers. Now, we'll be starting with the punch, even though most of the papers talk about the protest. So on the punch, it says, hunger protests, Tinubu's speech attracts knocks and kudos. Um, the writers here says, showing her PDP slams, president's address. Another says, NGO others hail it. And finally, protesters organi protest organizers demand 1,150 detainees released. Now, I'm sure you've um, listened to the president's speech. You heard the president, um, you know, talking about the, about the protest, saying, let's leave room for dialogue. They've heard us loud and clear. Um, they're going to do everything that is needful. So we understand that. But Something that Wale Shoinka had said was um, the protest did not even really talk about police brutality. It didn't really mention anything or even show any atom of care to the people who have lost their lives, especially in Kanu, you're in Kanu, and we see what has happened there. And the president not even trying to um, un just even say that something like this happened, just touch on it a bit. What do you think about the president's speech, the entire speech, not even the fact that he did not really touch on police brutality, his entire speech, what was your take from that? You see, the entire speech is about 38 prog uh, paragraphs, mm. but I think it is um, a, a, a waste opportunity mm. 
Mm. Uh, the government had a golden opportunity to put things right, but uh, actually the uh, speech didn't touch anything on that issue. For one thing, uh, the issue of uh, at stake, what caused the strike, the president never said anything about it. Okay. Secondly, uh, he went and rehashed what he has been saying since uh, his inauguration that this is what they are going to do, this is what they have achieved, and so on, which is not what uh, the people want. And thirdly, you know, except for in passing that he mentioned uh, people lost their life, uh, there is uh, nothing that he said to show that um, there is a sense of concern. In other places, you know, even if the head of state is out of the country, if they lose one life, the president will, or the head of state will leave his official reason and go back to attend that issue. But here we are, many people lost their life and uh, nothing has been done and nothing is going to be uh, done at all. And uh, most importantly uh, is the fact that the speech, you know, has just swept the problem under the carpet mm. because what he said was that um, when he said the security should now maintain law and order, you know, what it means is he's giving them they, 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 they go ahead to go with their, uh, the way they are handling things. So that is why after the speech here in Kano, uh, we, you know, we are so much uh, bombarded with uh, shootings up in the air and so on. Because, you know, once you tell the security agencies that you are giving them directive, it's like a license. Mm. And the worst part of it is that uh, they, they are using light bullets. In so many places where you are handling civil uh, cases like this, now all you need to do is perhaps use tear gas, which is also not uh, good, but uh, at least it's lower in terms of problem. Maybe tear gas, water cannon, and uh, maybe in ex ex extreme cases, uh, rubber bullet. Mm. But people, I mean, the, uh, the security agencies were using light bullet. Yeah. If you see them, you know, the way they are captured, is as if they are on two groups and they are just spreading these things and uh, you know they set a trap on the issue so i think the speech actually left a lot to be done and uh, i think it is um, like i say sweeping the problem under the carpet mm. <clears throat> because even if the government now succeed in heading up uh, uh, this uh, crisis i mean these protests now, I think they are just postponing the inevitable unless they take measures to address the issues. Yeah. If they don't, I think that is where we are heading. Mm. So talking about, you know, the directive and stuff, do you think this is just a way to suppress the people? Um, because, of, of course, we've seen protests happen in um, other times. For instance, there was the hashtag NSES protest and... We know things that happened allegedly during that time. Now, it seems as though that the government always wants to find a way to suppress you in a way that when we make, you know, when we make a mess of a, a few people, you will be scared. So is that what's happening right now, whereby they're threatening you, threatening your life and saying, you know what, it's better for you to stay home. If you come out, you might just have a, you might just get shot at. Of course, we're shooting in the air. We're not directly shooting at you, but a stray bullet or something could just happen to you. Is that the aim? Is that is the aim to suppress people to ensure that they do not voice out what they feel? Yeah, that is what is it. You see, even a military regime, they don't do what uh, we are seeing now. Mm. Uh, the, the, the security agents, you know, what they need to do uh, with the Constitution uh, provides that they will manage the uh, protest so that it doesn't go out of hand. But uh, the way they are doing it is just they are using force uh, to quell the a process, I mean the protest, or they are using it to scare, to intimidate others from joining. That is what we have seen. And, uh, you know, what we are seeing is not just shooting in the air. Directly, some of them were, were hit. Uh, 
unfortunately, like uh, in Kuruna, uh, one of the ladies that was killed was a pregnant woman. She just went to the hospital and came back with her children, and she was shot, and so many people. Majority of uh, the people who were killed uh, were not even in the protests. So I see moving post is just to quell it, using post is to intimidate uh, people, but the irony of it is that the more you use force, the more you harden uh, the people. Because after all, some will say, what is it is this? Whether they stay at home, they are going to die with uh, hunger. If they come out, maybe they are going to have uh, pasta days. So I think that is what uh, you do. You see, when you have force, it's better you use it in deterrence then you apply it. By the time you apply it, you are now hardening the people uh, against uh, the use of force. Mm. Well, on The Guardian here, it says, outrage over rehash of old policies, threats, failure to soothe protesters. So, of course, this is um, when we're talking about threats, in a way, it's like intimidation. But hopefully, they know that intimidation would just always not work because you were just saying they're not really attacking the issue. They're not really talking about the issue. They're just trying to sweep it under the carpet and move on. So let's just ensure that we do not have protests in Nigeria. We've listened to you. Please go home. And it just seems like there is no form of succor given to the people. Anyways, if we move over to the business NG, um, it says 10 years, 20 protests mixed economic effect on Nigerians. Now, if we're looking at the analysis and seeing how many protests have actually, um, you know, come up in 10 years, that's a lot. And it just seems like the, the government is really not even listening. But at this point, if we're here now with this hashtag and bad governance protest, do you think this is going to serve as a wake up call to the government, knowing that um, something, a revolution might just happen really soon? Yeah, you see, uh, the way the, the headline is saying is that on the average, we have two protests uh, per year, in year. Uh, which means in 10 years, we have uh, 20 protests. But unfortunately for us, despite these protests, uh, usually the government response has always been uh, repressive. And uh, some measures sometimes are taken immediately. But uh, as soon as... Uh, you know, the tension cools down, we'll go back to uh, business as usual. I mean, investing will be done. Now, what we are seeing now, that is why I say they are pushing the scene, they're sweeping it under the carpet, because what the government is saying, it is adamant that uh, the root cause of uh, the uh, problem which is, uh, you know, subsidy removal, uh, plotting of the Naira, taxation, insecurity, and so many things. The government is not saying that they are going to address that. In part, they are coming out possibly to say that it is on course and that what the people need is just to be patient, and that is what uh, the way out of the problem. Instead of, you know, coming out to address it. So I think what we are seeing here, uh, eventually uh, the government will not address it because from the speech of the president, uh, I think he is just um, strongly, uh, you know, uh, re-emphasizing commitment to uh, the problem, I mean the issue, so which is the cause of the problem. So I think... Um, whether we have seen uh, 10, uh, I mean, 20 protests in 10 years, uh, probably, I don't want to sound a, a, like a prophet of doom, uh, this uh, one may not be the last of the uh, protests that we are like, going to see, uh, unless the government uh, has the will to address the issue that is at stake which is the issue of poverty, which is the issue of hunger, which is the issue of insecurity, and so many things that uh, the protesters have uh, mentioned. Mm. I know that um, someone had come out to say there's going to be another protest in, um, in October. So if the government doesn't 
listen and do what is right by then there might just be another protest but we're hoping that you know it doesn't happen and the government will start to listen and this might just serve as a wake-up call now one thing that you know skyrocketed all of this or one thing that um, made us even get here in the first place was the fact that when the president assumed office he said fuel subsidy was gone and that made that product so expensive which now has a ripple effect on almost everything and even on our economy as well now because that product is something that you know aids transportation is something that you know you need to be able to move you need to be able to you know even support your business you need that as an alternative source of power and this is another one, another headline here on the punch that says marketers stop fuel supply, queues resurface. Do you think this is going to even agitate people even more? Yeah, it is going to. You see, the, in spite of what uh, we are seeing now, actually, uh, this is showing the insensitivity of uh, the people on what is happening in uh, in Nigeria. Actually, everybody knows this is the cost of the, in the strike. So why are you now, uh, before even the dust has settled down, you are now bringing the same issue that uh, we are going to see you now, and we are now withdrawing, and at the end of it, what we are going to see is going to be a blame game. Marketers will blame this, the other will blame this one for uh, the problem. And before you know it, uh, the, the price, uh, the cost of it will just be uh, settled as it is. But actually, actually, if you look at the whole issue of uh, poor subsidy, uh, take away even the pressure from outside. By the way the government is doing is an admission of failure. Because what the government is saying is that there are few people who are benefiting from that. Okay, and uh, now the government is admitting that they don't have the power to punish those few people. So instead of it, they now turn the problem on the majority of uh, people. So that is what is the, the whole politics about uh, this whole subsidy. And that is why you see uh, your marketers will come out with this, another one will come, and there will be blame game, like I said. So I think it's uh, part of the insensitivity the uh, nonchalant attitude to the actual feelings of Nigeria and the actual uh, problem of Nigeria. Otherwise, in a situation like this, I think uh, whether the marketers and NPC or anybody who has in hand in uh, oil problem will, might, might have keep quiet so that they don't inflame the situation that we are in now. Well, hopefully it doesn't inflame the situation, like you said. But um, another issue that people had was the fact that the government has said, you know, tighten up your belts, let's make certain sacrifices. And something that a lot of people were saying was, you are not willing to make those sacrifices. How can you tell me to make sacrifices? How can you tell me to be patient? Meanwhile, you have a, an overbloated cabinet. Meanwhile, you guys are spending frivolously on things that even don't matter, forgetting about the people who you are to serve. And so a small headline here on the punch says public debt may hit 130 trillion in Naira by December. And that is a report. What do you think about the fact that we're borrowing so much and we're just not even seeing what the money is, is being used for? Yeah, this is a part of the uh, is part of the irony. You see, the government is saying, or oh, the leaders are saying, sacrifice, be patient, and so on, and yet they are not leading by example. Had it been the uh, leading by example, I think all Nigerians will willingly come out in you know to support these issues. But here we are, uh, people are dying of hunger and, and poverty and insecurity, and yet. The, 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 we are overspending, like uh, I, we have endless uh, resources. And secondly, we are borrowing. And this borrowing is, is such that, one, people don't see the result of the borrowing uh, anywhere. Uh, secondly, the borrowing keeps on mounting. You know, we are borrowing in order to, you know, uh, pioneers mold it and uh, you know so that we have resources for people to stay uh sorry i don't want to say uh, still but they embezzle uh that way 
Look at what uh, the uh, Minister of Law and Appeals said uh, last week uh, about this borrowing. She said um, what they have is that uh, any time the government borrows from uh, IMF and World Bank, uh, the IMF and World Bank will take 40% of what they lend to the state uh, on the ground that it is consultancy fee. So you see, that is part of the reason why we are not seeing the money. Already what, the, what we are going to pay is going to be 100%, but they are giving us only 60% because they say they take uh, 40% in, uh, in terms of consultancy fee. And the remaining 60%, you know, is where you have embezzlement, uh, where you have your corruption and other things. So that is why for every matter that we borrow, Already, I mean, for every 100 naira that we borrow, already a uh, 40 naira is gone uh, mm. to that consultancy. So the remaining 60 percent, uh, 60 naira, uh, I'm doing it in naira so that people will understand. The remaining 60 naira is such that uh, about uh, 50 naira will be embarrassed through fictitious corruption and so on. So the remaining 10 naira is what will be uh, put in ground. And, uh, you know, in that way also, the project will be uh, for one naira, they will now make it like a, a five, a 50 naira or whatever. So there is over bloating. So that is why people cannot see, because it's a simple thing. Money cannot put result unless you put it to work. But where you have money being siphoned, where it's in Basel, people will not see the project on ground. Hmm. I mean, it's quite unfortunate because I know that Nigeria is blessed with so much yet we see so little or even nothing at all and we have to keep borrowing and we're not even seeing what the monies are being used for instead people are enriching their pockets when they get into offices um i don't know what they're planning on doing especially when it comes to tackling corruption but i just hope that one day you know we'll have a corrupt free nation i know it might seem like wishful thinking but I'm sure it's doable and it just starts with each and every one of us saying we want to do the right thing and we just want to ensure that we're not corrupt. But speaking on the economy and, you know, everything that's happening, there's another headline here on The Guardian. It says import duty FX rises to 1,618 naira per dollar despite president's oh, well despite tinubu's pledges so uh, the president has pledged you know they've said a lot right but you're still seeing the import duty rise to a thousand six hundred and eighteen naira how is this even going to help do you think this is do you think this is a recipe for disaster in as much as the government is saying something saying be patient um just give us some more time things will get better but on a daily basis you're seeing things like this. What does this say to the common man? Is there even any hope for the common man? Actually, it is dashing the hope of the common man and is dashing the hope of virtually everybody, mm -hmm. except for those who are benefiting from uh, it. So these are the ones who are not, uh, you know, hope, hopeless on the issue. But as far as uh, the average in Nigeria is concerned, uh, we are being pushed into that hopelessness because the way things are going, uh, as if, you know, it is a, a, a curse on us, the more the government comes out and says they are going to do X, uh on on this issue the more it becomes uh, you know more complicated and uh, so like this what we are seeing now is people are making it a cash cow so it is uh, disheartening to see uh that uh, the way the government is doing is just counterproductive and the other thing is actually in reality we are just giving lip service okay mm -hmm. and thirdly there is issue of impunity People, you know, even if the government says that this is what they are going, to, they are planning to do, some people will sabotage it, uh, and uh, nothing will be done to them. So unless you have rule of law, unless you now impose these things, that is why you will be able to uh, do that. But otherwise, the way we are making people hopelessness, hopelessness, uh, you know, hopeless rather on on the issue, the way things are going, actually. 
by those in a uh, postponed in the inevitable even if there is not going to be crisis we are going to uh, we are heading towards grounding the economy towards grounding the nation and when you ground it down what will happen that is what people don't want us to see that is what we all fear that we shouldn't go into that direction mm. on the business ng it says money supply hits all-time high inflation risk intensify what can the government do right now to ensure that you know inflation because inflation is already super high and of course everybody wants inflation to come down to about you know 19 percent in fact it has been promised that do not worry inflation is going to come down we're looking at 20 percent by the end of the year but if we're seeing inflation that is about 40 percent well that's for food inflation and there is still the risk that it might intensify even more. Do you think the government is doing anything in their part to ensure that things get better for Nigerians? Well, actually, you know, in terms of uh, policy pronouncement, they are making it. But in terms of actual policies mm. on the ground, they are not doing that. Because it is one thing you now say this is what we are planning to do, X, Y, and Z. And then it is another for you to take concrete action uh, to address the uh, problem. You see, one thing that the government ought to do is that, uh, uh, you know, being the largest uh, uh, sector uh, the government has to cut on uh, you know to, 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 to drastically cut the cost of governance mm. now by the time they take that one they they are likely going to chuck off uh, the issue of inflation by about 50 percent because that is where the, uh, the uh, money goes and secondly they have to come out with uh, policies that will create conducive environment to do it for example, uh, one thing that we do is when we plot the Naira, like here in northern Nigeria, uh, you know, we are close to uh, Nigeria and Cameroon and so on. Yeah. Their currency uh, is so strong that they will come in here with little money, they exchange, they exchange it and get a lot of Naira and buy things, you know, what the ordinary person cannot afford. Okay, they can easily buy it at about three times or five times and they go, they, they buy it freely. So I think these are the things. I let the government, you know, have an integrated economic policy. Uh, that is why, uh, how they can address the issue of inflation. Uh, the, the question that, uh, yeah, they are worried that yeah, we are doing this and after all then the government will come up with other policies that are counterproductive, add tax here, do these things and so on. So unless we look at it holistically, we are not addressing the problem of inflation. And as long as inflation is going on, all chain of other events will go. This is what uh, neoliberalism is all about, that inflation is the sole problem, I mean, the, the mother of all problems in any nation, and yet we are not addressing it. We think we can take part of the neoliberalism and then forget uh, the basic uh, tenets of it. Mm. I completely agree with you when you talk about cutting the cost of governance. I feel like that might just be... Um, a way to tell the people that we hear you and we understand you and we're trying to put actions in place to ensure that, you know, we're saving money because you cannot have um, an over bloated cabinet. You can't not have all of these ministries. You cannot have all of this. And you're spending so much money and telling the Nigerian people to be patient. And of course, they are seeing what the numbers are. They are seeing inflation go up. They go to the markets, they spend money, and they know that they cannot afford the basic necessities of life. The things that they used to be able to afford before, they cannot afford it anymore. And you're still telling them to be patient. So I completely agree with you with, the cutting, the, with cutting the cost of governance. And I feel like that would just even help with building trust between the Nigerian people and the government. Because now we can trust that you're doing what is in the best interest for Nigerians. Let's move over to Nature News. And Nature News leads with Obasanjo raises alarm on an impending civil unrest. The writer says attributes mass poverty to gas flaring, abandoning agri. So when he says impending civil unrest, it just makes me 
um, chuckle a little bit because I'm like, we've already seen a protest that has happened from the 1st of August till now. And if that's not even a civil unrest, I don't know what that is. So for Obasanjo to be saying, the former president, to be saying there's an impending civil unrest, that's quite alarming. But two things he highlighted here were gas flaring, well, well, poverty, um, you know, he attributes poverty to gas flaring and abandoning agriculture. Do you agree with him? And if you do, um, what are the ways to go about this? What do you think the government is supposed to be looking at, especially if a former president is even telling you that not, um, you know, tackling things like gas flaring, not having to ensure that you're doing so much in agriculture, um, you know, is going to cause a civil unrest in the future. What do you think? Oh, yeah, it's true, actually. Uh, these issues um, have a direct bearing. Uh, to, to uh, the well-being of Nigeria. They have direct bearing on the security. They have direct bearing on the income, you know, uh, economic strengths of uh, uh, Nigeria. Because by the way we are planning gas, uh, since, you know, it, uh, oil has discovered, you know, if you go to the, you know, you are from that area, and uh, we just visit it, and we see the clearing is uh, 24 hours, seven days a week, and, uh, you know, every day it is there. So we see how we are wasting resources, which, and if we use it, at least we can have a, 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 an area that we can have, uh, uh, what do you call it, huge income from Nigeria. And we are going to address so many issues. Had it been, we have gas system, a very good this issue of deforestation and other things will not be there. And uh, things, uh, energy will be cheap. So we, that is the economic side of it and the side of the environmental effect. Now, on the other hand, when we look at the way we abandon agriculture we also pay we only pay new service to agriculture now, this is why we are where we are now because actually god has uh, blessed nigeria with uh, you know an abundant uh, good uh, condition so that anything that uh, we need we can you know uh, grow it in nigeria and even export it but we are neglecting it so by the time you have these two problems of poverty you have the two problems of hunger what you're saying actually is what we are seeing now and uh, like i said right from the beginning of this i know the government takes serious measures to address it we are just postponing the inevitable. Perhaps we are not hoping, we are not praying. We are just praying that this thing will not happen. But actually, uh, these two twin problems, if not addressed, the civil arrest that we are seeing now will be like a child play. Because at that time, when it is spontaneous, this one, what we are seeing is a kind of organized one. Yeah. They give the government about one month's notice. But when you push... Uh, people and when they just come abruptly so that is what is the, the more dangerous than this kind of thing which uh you know uh, give time for government to prepare to address and so on so that i uh, quite agree with uh, uh, uh obasanjo on these issues mm. that's quite scary we just hope that you know the government is listening they're, you know, putting measures in place, putting policies in place that would just help the Nigerian people because we do not want to get to that place of, you know, civil unrest. That's just, that's just really scary. But let's move over to another story here. Finally, um, Governor Deary meets protesters, promises solution to food price hike. Now, we are used to the government making promises, and this is a governor, well, of Bielsa, and making promises to food price hike. I know that is just for a state, but do you think we're going to see any, um, you know, any light at the end of the tunnel for people, especially when it comes to food prices, because that's one of the most expensive commodity in Nigeria. And it's so basic. It's something that you need that to survive, sadly. It is expensive that a lot of people cannot afford it, and so there's hunger in the land. But do you think that the government is doing anything at all to ensure that the food price hike is being tackled right now? Actually, they are not doing anything. Uh, even if they are doing it, it is too little, too late mm. uh, on uh, the way they are handling it. You see, like I said, Nigeria is blessed with a uh, good uh, environment, uh, land, and so on. Had it been 
you know, also the governors take uh, that one. Each, each state has a, an area that it has comparative advantage mm. in terms of agriculture. This is where at a local level, you know, the state will look at these issues and see how do they promote, uh, you know, uh, agricultural policy in their own places. If it is an agriculture, if it is fishery, depending on the area, each one, the government could now pay serious attention on that one to have a kind of large-scale uh, planning, or at least to subsidize it in such a way that uh, farmers will be able to uh, produce. And secondly, and most importantly, they secure the place, like here in the north, uh, had it been the government, you know, put it said uh, to ensure security in the place, we will not, uh, at least the issue of food insecurity will be done. As the saying goes, no nation play politics uh, with uh, food yeah. and survive. They, you cannot play politics with three things, uh, uh, food, education, and security. But here we are, we are playing politics with it, which is a dangerous game the way we are handling it. I think those are just like the basic welfare that people expect, the education, food and, and security. That's just basic because that's even the primary responsibility of the government. So I know that in other countries, well, in, the Ameri in America, for instance, um, food is being subsidized, and you're wondering what's the government of Nigeria doing? What are they subsidizing for the people to just ensure that we're okay, we stay afloat? I hope that they are really looking at measures. They're really looking at policies that would just help us, like I said, when it comes to food, when it comes to education, when it comes to healthcare, and when it comes to tackling insecurity as well. Because we do not want a revolution. We do not want a point whereby Nigerians are going to take to the streets and it's going to be a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of world. We want a place where there is peace, where there's san sanity, in fact, sanity here in Nigeria. And we're just flourishing and everybody's happy. We have a community that is flourishing and hopefully that would be soon. It would not tarry. It would not take too long. Hopefully the Nigerian government will see this as a wake-up call and start to do what is needful. Professor Camillo Sanifage, we want to say thank you so much for coming. It's always a pleasure reviewing the papers with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we've been speaking with Professor Camillo Sanifage. He's from the Department of Political Science by Euro University, Kanu. And we'll just be taking global stories amid headlines in our national dailies this morning.